First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this kind of invitation. I come to Marseille <laughs> as much as possible recently. <laughs> okay. And um, since I understood that part of the audience has not been working on these kind of topics, I will present a lecture that is not really very new. So at the end, I will give you an idea of what we are doing now. Uh, let me see. OK, so the outline is produced by this uh, software. And looks nice to me. OK. Uh, the beginning is that uh, my talk is based on a motivation for evolution equations that is different from geometry. And that the motivation is diffusion. In many cases, the, the end equation is the same, but in many equations it is not. And the idea is that diffusion equations are very important in many applications, and the way the applications tell you what to do is something that we take into account. In particular, many people are now working in fluids. So if you do diffusion for fluids, you are doing more or less navier stocks, which is not what I do. But if you do for chemicals, it's diffusion in reaction. If you do for animal populations, maybe it's nonlinear diffusion, and we did a lot of of that. If you do it for the stock market, then you do uh, black souls models. But uh, essentially, the good point of diffusion is that it has a mother equation that uh, allows you to go back home. It's like going to home for Christmas. And we all people in diffusion know that mother equation is heat equation. And this is very good because many of the inspirations come back to mother. And of course, this equation is very well known and has influenced not only people in mathematics, also people in physics and engineering. But in mathematics, it has an influence on people in PDEs, but also in functional analysis, also in geometry, also in probability. So there are many people mixing together. And the way we do heat equation in the modern style is combining the information for all, from all of them. So one of the things you really know from the beginning in this heat equation community is that the Gaussian function is very important. And if there is no Gaussian, you look for a Gaussian or semi-Gaussian or whatever. And in our, in our community, we do lots of uh, non-Gaussian functions that are called Barenblatt functions. But then you do sometimes Fourier analysis, and you do a spectral decomposition. And if you go this direction, you have Dirichlet forms, maximum principles. And if you do probability, you have another idea of how to do things, which is Brownian motion. And in some sense, uh, even Brownian motion people know that you generate a semi-group. So you go back to functional analysis. And there is lots of, uh, there is a big, very rich community that works in these things. Now, all you, what I want to say in this first transparency is that uh, uh, we don't work on one thing. We have to know more or less what's going on in all of this community because you never know where the theorem will come or what is the way of proving it. In my experience, in the years between uh, uh, 1980 and 2000 and something, uh, the type of equation I was interested in is nonlinear heat equations. And nonlinear heat equations are interesting objects that have a a certain operator that is not the Laplacian, and you split the Laplacian by putting uh, this thing is the, the, the divergence, and this thing is the gradient. And in the middle of the divergence and the gradient, which is the typical splitting of the Laplacian, you put a non-linearity. And this is a source of nonlinear Laplacians that are called uh, porous medium, P Laplacians, Stefan problems. And then another possibility of complicating the heat equation is putting lower order terms that are functions of x, t, u, and gradient u. 
so first order maximum. And the idea is that in the 1960s, functional analysis, nonlinear functional analysis was so strong after the work of the Georgi, Moser, Nash, Serring, etc., that uh, they thought that they could, in maybe 20 years, write a book about that. And then it was not possible. So when I came to this community, they were discussing about asking for 20 more years to write the book. And when 20 years went by, we discovered that the only way to tackle the problem is writing books on every separate equation because it was too rich. And this is true because now we know that part of, in, in particular, in this formulation, there is hidden the Yamaha flow and the Ricci flow into D. So it's too rich. But nobody knew that at the time. And uh, books about, there are general books about how to start the theory. But then once you start the theory, the relevant questions do not belong to the, real, to the theory of quasi-linear PDEs. The quasi-linear PDE people show you how to prove existence theorem and don't go much further. If you want to know, for instance, ancient solutions, it's a new business. You have to do geometric, geometrical approach or monotonicity formulas, ODE analysis, construction of solitons. Okay, so many of the specific examples considered now classical nonlinear diffusion models have been investigated and for, for many years. And the four important examples were the Stefan problem, which is the phase transition, typical phase transition between two fluids, for instance, ice and water, with a free boundary. And free boundaries have been very important in these nonlinear heat equations. The next thing was the hill show problem, which is a potential flow in a thin layer between two solid plates. And then another model was the porous medium equation, and another was the evolution p Laplacian equation. And these four equations were part of the many equations that appear around, but these were the four equations that I had around my, in my desk all the time for 20 years. And then if you go to the typical reaction diffusion where you don't complicate the Laplacian, but you add lower order terms, then this is very interesting because it looks like naive. U to the P is lower order. But if P is larger than one, solutions blow up in finite time. And this was a real discovery because it was the simplest mechanism to produce solutions that blow up in finite time and produce a nonlinear singularity, a singularity that was not present in the data. And once this progress was done in this reaction diffusion, which we call Fujita equation, many other equations were attacked by people because Singularities became attackable. You can do them. This was the simplest case. Okay. So the idea that I want to do now is forget this past history. Around uh, 2004, Luis Caffarelli, uh, the person with whom I had the pleasure to work, uh, proposed uh, to a number of people around him, his group that it was the time to do uh, nonlinear models based on fractional diffusion. O sea, in principle, the idea of fractional diffusion is linear. And the fractional, uh, por fractional heat equation is very simple to write. It's ut plus minus Laplacian to power s, and power s is some interpolation power of the Laplacian that I will define for you. And uh, if you do that, and you define the Laplacian uh, to a certain intermediate power between zero and one, which you can do by harmonic analysis, then you can generate a semigroup. The people who did that were, no, were not really people in analysis. The evolution associated to fractional operators were, was done by people in stochastics stochastic processes, because it was discovered that the typical Brownian motion approach that produces the heat equation was not relevant model for many processes where things do not converge to the Gaussian. And people knew that. 
but nobody in this probability community, very strong community, uh, was interested in producing a nonlinear theory because the machinery of stochastic processes was already working a very difficult process in the linear setting. And this is what Cavarelli proposed. Listen, listen, if we know that these people in stochastic have made this enormous progress in the linear case, and we can do estimates, which is nonlinear, we can translate back and do the nonlinear case by forgetting probabilities. Essentially, this is the idea. And then you will put the probabilities back when we finished. And this idea worked, and he began with the elliptic case. And when I went there to work with him in 2007, he proposed to me that we should work on this porous medium case. But let me first tell you what is a nonlinear. Uh, a, a linear version of the Laplacian in the fractional case. The simplest idea is to use Fourier analysis and interpolate in the multiplier. The multiplier corresponding to the Laplacian is C squared, so you say C2S. And uh, what you do is just apply Fourier back. And if you are working in L2, which is the good space to go back and forth, maybe you get a certain representation. In fact, the representation can be done, and it is not a convolution because the operator, uh, the, no, the kernel that corresponds to the Laplacian, to the to S, is too singular. And then the, the version that you get as an integral has in the denominator this power M plus 2S that makes the kernel non-integrable. So if you put, you to you y upstairs, you don't get any integral. But then there is a trick that people in harmonic analysis knew. This is due to Einstein in the West and to Lankov in Russia, the two books that are classic in that, that you get one of these uh, hypersingular operators where you put ux minus uy, and if u is regular, then you get u x minus u y, for instance, holder, a certain power of x minus y that compensates for the two s. So in the class of functions that are holder, this is well defined. And in the rest, you use harmonic analysis, <laughs> extension of the operator. If you are allowed to define the operator in a certain core, then you complete the operator by doing estimates in a certain space. I will show you the space later. So this is the idea that was already present in the people who did harmonic analysis in the 70s. And the next idea is that since the people who motivated the operator were people in stochastics, let me tell you why they were interested. It's just a simple question. If you have a discrete a stochastic processing that leads to the heat equation, essentially you think about random walk, where you are here and then there is a grid of possible sites where you jump when t goes up, and this is x, suppose that you are in one dimension, you are here and you may jump here and here. And from here you jump here, or here, or here, or here. So jumping, you discover that the probability of being in the next neighbor is one half, one half. But the probability of being far away is one half, and then is one fourth, one, one, one half, one fourth. And you discover very easily that you get this Bernoulli representation that converges to the Gaussian. So then you pass from the discrete model discrete stochastic process to the continuous stochastic process, and you get random walk converges to the Wiener process. This is well known. Now, what is the news? The news is that in some cases that are very present in the modern society, this idea that elementary interactions or movements of particles in a grid do not take place according to the next neighbor assumption. In fact, in, in order to prove that you get in the limit a continuous model that is the Wiener process, which in partial differential equations means that this is the heat equation, so you're back home. It's like Christmas. Stop it here. 
So we are now in the heat equation. This is the typical thing. Einstein, in 1905, studying the, the Brownian motion, said, you don't need to assume that things go to next neighbor. You can assume that this is a continuous grid, and you go to a certain distribution that is a certain probability of jumping from X to Y, and you assume that this thing is integrable and has two moments, which means that it has to decay quickly so that you multiply by X minus Y and it's still integrable. If it decays quickly, then you get the heat equation. The point is that do not decay quickly. And why do you do this? And in particular, it's very simple. If you think about information theory in the area where you are using Google, it doesn't make any sense to say that the interactions of information between Marseille and India are exponentially less than interactions between Marseille and uh, Puy de Dombo. Normally, you talk more to people in Bangalore. And this is the point. The distances are completely wrong in that sense. In probability, still you go down. But you go down with a certain power. And the power is not such a big power. And doesn't have two moments. So you don't get, the idea is that then you get P is like eight, one minus X minus Y, and uh, minus two S, or in that case, you don't get in these interactions, you don't get integrability. Or even if you get one over x minus y, n plus two s, you don't get two moments. So in that case, you cannot apply the Gaussian. So what do you get? And this is what we wanted to know. And so the case here is that uh, these processes are called Levy processes, and the people in probability knew that they have distributions that are the alpha stable processes. And uh, this is very good. Once you get this discrete model where the, distance, the, the probabilities of jumping from side J to K are powers of the distance from I to K, but not such a big power, negative power, then you get in the limit the process, and the process is not the Gaussian. And this is the way you, but the problem of these things is that they are too linear. How do you do it in the nonlinear case, where you can get integrals with test functions, and you, you, you get something that is called the nonlinear estimates, energy estimates. And then you have to think about potential theory that could be nonlinear. And one of the beautiful things that Louis Caffarelli introduced with this idea of extending the extension of the operator. They put, in general form, something that was known before in a particular case. Suppose that you have here the space x in arena, and you have a function u of x, and you want to calculate the fractional ablation. What you do is you extend this to a certain potential that I am calling v, which is a function of x and y, with a new function y larger than zero that is the virtual dimension. So you invent a new dimension like in theoretical physics. And now in this new dimension, you have an external potential that satisfies an elliptic equation of v equals zero. And you say, so what do you do with your potential? And then you take the trace operator, trace of v. In fact, you take the trace of the du, d, dv over dn. And the trace is probably a weighted trace. And this is my minus Laplacian to the s. If you do the harmonic analysis, you find that the hyper singular integral is exactly what happens in this extension. If you do it with alpha equals 1, then there is no weight, and the operator is the, no, the normal operator. If you do it with alpha different from one, then there is a weight. Uh, sorry about the, the, the notations. I am using minus Laplacian S, and also minus Laplacian alpha over two. It is impossible to make the community agree in using only S or only alpha. But we got a very important victory. If you put S, there is no half. If you put alpha, there is a half.
Okay, so the next thing is that uh, all of these possibilities work in Arena, but do not work in a bounded domain. And then there was a problem, what do you do when you are working in bounded domains? In probability, you know that in that case, particles bump on the, on the boundary or jump outside. You have to discuss this issue. This is a different issue. That is very interesting. It took some time to understand it. We are working on that now. So suppose you are in Areno. The basic books to learn this potential theory and Laplace and so on are Lankov, Stein, and Davis. So let me tell you what is what we wanted to do. Before I present the, the real equation we were solving, let me tell you the equation we solved before. It was the porous medium equation. Porous medium equation is just a very close uh, sibling of the heat equation, where the only difference is u to the m, and usually we take m larger than 1. In the case of uh, Professor Daskalopoulos, she took m less than 1 to do Yamabe problem. If m is larger than 1, then the coefficient of diffusion is m times u to the m minus 1, which is degenerate at u equals 0, and this is called slow diffusion and creates free boundaries. And the study of learning all of this theory took many years, and it is not similar to the classical heat equation because the nonlinearity makes it appear lots of things that are very different. In the case m less than 1, some people, in theory, were not very happy to do it because they say maybe there is no motivation and people will criticize the papers. And then there was this beauty, they discovered the Yamabe problem. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> and there were many other problems. Let me tell you why this equation is very different from the heat equation. If you take m equals 2 and take the Laplacian of u2, you get this term, and you get this term. And this term is okay as long as u is positive. But if u is zero, this term is leading order. So on the level u equals zero, which is the free boundary, the equation is iconal, iconal equation and propagates by, with Friday speed. So the idea is that, uh, oh, let me jump on this thing, just wanted to show you that this equation was derived by people who did porous medium for the oil extraction petroleum industry. So the, the origin of these uh, diffusion equations comes from engineers. And for many years the engineers didn't know how to do the mathematics, and the mathematicians didn't know if this was important enough. So it took us until 1950 in Moscow to discover that this model, which is a model of filtration of fluids in the ground using Darcy law, was also important in uh, plasma physics. And then in Moscow they were very interested in plasma physics in 1950, the Cold War, and they developed immediately the theory. In 10 years they did most of it. Impressive. So let me jump on that. The point is that this equation, let me write it again, ut equals Laplacian um, in particular ut equals Laplacian u square, doesn't have a Gaussian. The point of the heat equation is that if you want to do a general analysis of what is going on for a long time, and you want to copy for the heat equation, solutions with compact support will tend to the Gaussian or whatever. In the case of this equation, there is no Gaussian, but there is a cell similar solution. Cell similarity was something that came into the picture because there were a very strong group of geometrical analysis based on uh, symmetry analysis, the school of Noether, Amy Noether. And they discovered that cell similarity was true here, and they wrote the, they wrote the possible solution, the same as the heat equation, the Gaussian, but instead of putting exponential, they said, let us put a certain f, and then do not put t to the minus n halves. And in, 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 inside, do not be T one half. And they found the profile that is explicit. This is one of these wonders of the theories. They are based on objects that have, in many cases, explicit forms. And this allows the theory to go on, because this is probably a very strong solution in the parabolic theory, because it's a parabola which is a very strong argument for we are very practical people. In, in that case, we are very simple-minded. 
Now, it is not a parabola because of the one over n minus one. So the real function is V equals U to the n minus one that we call the pressure. And we, wrote the, we write the pressure equation Vt equals n minus one V Laplace and V plus gradient V square. And this is the pressure equation that we do in many of the cases. Now, if you write the V, it's a parabola. So it's a very good parabolic function. In particular, the Laplacian of this V equals minus C over T, where V is positive. Fantastic. It's really a semi-lower uh, harmonic. Okay, so this is the point. And it was a theorem that was proved that this will help also for the fast diffusion. And the picture is algebraically the same. But curiously, it's not geometrically the same. In one case is this, in one case is this. The, 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 the mystery of this different geometry is in the signs of the constants. This is a very compact probability distribution. And this is a very distributed probability distribution. So in both cases, the theorem you want to prove is that you converge to this thing as t tends to infinity. And this theorem was proved. In one case, for the porous medium, you prove it with compact support. In another case, you prove it with a tail. And now let me go for the things that I want to do here. The thing I want to do here is a variation of this porous medium where I had ut equals gradient of u gradient of u to the n minus 1, essentially. In fact, if I write u to the n minus 1 like a pressure, I call it v. Let me call it v. Then v equals u to the n minus 1 is the pressure. And this looks like a conservation law. It's ut plus gradient of u gradient pressure. Let me call it p like in physics. Equal minus u, minus. This is a conservation law. Now, we wanted to start from this porous medium and try to see why people in st statistical physics could be interested in doing nonlinear flows with possible free boundaries using fractional diffusion. And you start the same way. But sorry for my notation, I will use now for the pressure, the letter P, P, because I want to tell uh, the people in physics that the gradient of P with, di with different sign is the velocity. And now V is velocity. And let me start then by derivation of the new equation that we wanted to study as ut plus divergence of u times a certain velocity equals zero. Let me also copy from the theory that v is the gradient of p. So why well, I'm doing the same theory. At a certain moment, I have to stop it, otherwise I get the same equation. And the way I stop it is that while in porous medium, the pressure is a function of the density, in particular u to the n minus 1, I will not assume that. I will assume, according to this information theory, that the velocity of the particles is motivated by a pressure. But the pressure is not a local pressure. It's an information pressure coming from the whole universe. And this is people, people in chemistry have discovered this idea in chemotaxis. And now the idea is very simple. What I will do is say that P is a certain kernel on U. If there is a distribution, this distribution creates an information pro pre pressure. And the information pressure drives the documents. The thing that you react sending things. Okay? This was done in stochastical in statistical physics. It's very easy to present in a talk by using the imagery of information. So the only thing I have to do is put this together by selecting a certain k that has nice uh, symmetry. Uh, invariance scaling properties. And everybody knew that the risk kernel is very good for that. 
then the risk kernel is just uh, integrating over the whole space. I come here, so I know now what I wanted to do. The kernel that allows people to jump from one place to another place and produce a certain new distribution, the pressure is based on a certain power that in this case is minus, my, my, less, than the, less than the density. Remember that then I have to differentiate twice. Let me see what is the end result. This is the end result. Ut equals divergence of u gradient p, and p is a kernel on u. Uh, and then if you want to put all together, which is nice for engineers like that, because the combinations of nablas have a strong erotic power on them. I don't know why, but they really like it. So one, two, there are two nablas up in one nabla, whatever. It's good for them. <laughs> eh? And then you put initial data and solve the problem. And the, the idea is that, uh, I just remember, here, recall here that fractional appraisals were first used when they began to do this nonlinear theory in elliptic equations, semilinear elliptic equations, like Laplacian S of U equals U to the P, the typical semilinear elliptic equations. So they knew lots of technology of elliptic. And uh, there are many works on the subject. There is a young guy from Barcelona who was a student of Cabret who wrote recently a very nice survey on non-local elliptic equations. This is the elliptic part. There are many things. Now, in the, in the case of the parabolic, uh, there was a paper by Biller, Karsh, and Monod. They were doing dislocation. Uh, based on a model by Professor Head. And the idea of dislocation is that when you have a grid, a crystal, there is dislocation, there are fault lines along which you jump like going to Bangalore. So the idea is that you can go very far in that direction. They did some analysis passing from the continuous, from the discrete to the continuous, and you get this equation. But essentially, the real motivation that we had, Louis, I mean, Louis Caffarelli, was a work by Jacobin and Levovitz in statistical physics, where they derived a certain model that says that the density satisfies an equation that says a divergence, and then it is a gradient of a certain f, which is a free energy functional, and this is the Gato derivative, and a certain coefficient, which is the diffusion, diffusivity. And uh, if you know some, uh, some of the work of these people, you believe that this is the way they work. And, but they assume the, nothing in particular. They say that this is very interesting, it should be studied. And in particular, the sigma should be quite general and positive, and the different, there are different free energies. It's impossible to do this problem in that generality. What we did is put sigma equals u, and put f equals uh, the, uh, the, the kernel, cor corresponding kernel. I mean, the gradient f is the corresponding kernel. F will be the bilinear form. I will tell you more later. The idea is that from this equation, we thought that it was too general. We went back to this ut equals divergence of u gradient of k of u. And k is the risk. People told us, if you, instead of risk kernels, you put Bessel kernels, which have this very beautiful dumping factor at infinity, is it easier? Is it easier, but then you don't get novelties, because in some sense the Bessel kernel kills the effect to go of going to Bangalore, and you don't want to kill this effect. But you can do this theory. Okay, so... Uh, uh, this is in some sense related to the Berger's equation. Uh, just to mention that in one dimension you get a version of Berger's equation. And uh, let me tell you that in case I got this kernel to be minus Laplacian minus one, which is differentiation, differentiation, integration twice, zero order operator, this is no more a differential operator. 
the limit case. And this was very interesting because it was a problem that appeared in hydrodynamics and there was something that was done by Silvia Serfati, Luigi Ambrosio and many other people. And then we discovered that this was the non-viscous limit of what we were doing. And this was very nice, we were discussing this thing in, in, with Serfati in Barcelona, and the impression at the beginning is that one of both, you or me, you or, or, or us, has to be wrong. And then we discovered that the, 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 the two theories fit, so the limit is superconductivity. Okay, so we wrote, wrote a paper on weak existence of weak energy solutions. We could not prove a good theory of existence and uniqueness of a strong solutions, which is what people like. But so we had to introduce these weak energy solutions based on a certain, we have to invent for weak energy solutions a certain energy. So it was, we, we, stopped, we stopped for a time because we didn't know what the energy was. So we asked the people in statistical mechanics and this was better because we knew that they didn't know. <laughs> and then we went on. Then when we discovered what was the energy, they say, of course. <laughs> we already told you. <laughs> okay, next is that we prove some similar profiles, which is what people, I mean, in the community that has some geometry, we do some similar all the time. And then we proved uh, regularity. The regularity approach is the famous work that is based on the George's ideas. Solutions that are integrable are bounded. If they are bounded, no, are L2. If they are L2, they are energy and then they are bounded. If they are bounded, they are C alpha. And they are C alpha, stop. It is nonlinear, you don't go farther than that. It takes a lot of work. It was a nightmare and we had to do it in two papers. And then we proved the limit of hydrodynamic limit. And I wrote a survey on this thing for the Abel Symposium. And uh, we wanted to prove convergence to certain barren blood solutions that we discovered. And it is very difficult, this is an open problem. In one dimension, we can do convergence to the barren blood fractional solutions of this model, uh, which is the same idea of trying to see if things converge to a certain cell similar thing. In two dimensions or more dimensions, we, know, we don't know how to do it. It's a problem of knowing enough about functional inequalities. So let me try to give you an idea of how to start. The idea is that the equation, this equation, is a divergence equation, and you want to integrate or multiply by you and, inter and integrate and integrate by parts. So the ideas is, are basic, conservation laws and energies. The first conservation law formally is integrating something that has a divergence and if these things go to zero at infinity, the integral of the divergence will be zero. And this is a formal computation that says that mass is conserved. It has to be proved and we prove it. Next, what is the energy? We fumbled around with u squared, u cubed, but it is difficult to get the uh, fractional Laplacian to do things with powers, because it's not true that there, are, there is a simple formula for the fractional Laplacian of a product. So all energy computations are very dangerous. And then we found that the Boltzmann energy works. And in fact, the calculation is really beautiful. Let me try to do it to you. It says, derivative with respect to t of u log u equals u t log u plus u u t over u this, this. This is a good start. Impressive. But then you say that log of u is divergence of u gradient of k of u. And you integrate by parts. And you get gradient u over u, u gradient of k of u. Yes, this. Magic. This is the Boltzmann magic. 
It is prepared to be Boltzmann like. And once you do this, you have minus gradient u, gradient of k of u, and you say, oh, k is an integral operator that has a square root. It's if, the, if you integrate the, the all, there is a scale of uh, risk operators, minus replacement to the minus s is minus replacement to the minus s half twice. So this is something that people in probability know. There are many of these operators in semigroups are infinitely divisible. They can have square roots, uh, cubic roots, any kind of roots. So now I use this thing that is, this is like minus, minus s, and this is like minus s halves. And s halves is very important. It's integrating s times. Not two s times, s times. So this is, so I get this thing. How do I get this thing to be a dissipation? So this is what I call the Boltzmann energy. And I said the derivative is minus a certain dissipation. And the dissipation, oh, this is a symmetric operator. I can split it into and part, part, part one here. And you get gradient of h of u. So H of U is the half potential. If you use the half potential to do an energy computation for the half potential, you get this beautiful formula. I leave it to you. And this was the beginning of the theory because now we know that the theory has two natural energies. The Boltzmann entropy plus the H energy. And the idea is, can you do something more? Of course, you can prove that solutions that are bounded will have the same bound forever. They're infinity bound. And this is very beautiful to prove because it's the, the maximum principle. It's easier than before because at the point of maximum, ut is positive, gradient u is zero, and if you differentiate, you get the Laplacian of k of u. But the Laplacian of k of u is a Laplacian positive, a k is a Laplacian negative, you get minus one minus s Laplacians. Count your Laplacians. This is Laplacian in one direction. This is the Laplacian in fractional back. So the combination of the two is minus a fractional Laplacian. But the fractional Laplacian has a formula. And the formula says that at a certain point you write this thing. This is the point of maximum, so this is positive, this is positive, this is negative, less than zero. In fact, it is less than zero unless the function is constant. So the strong maximum principle is easier. Once you have this, you have a beautiful situation because you say, then, then we have contraction. It is false. In nonlinear problems, even if you have L infinity bounds, you don't get contraction. And the main po point of the theory is we didn't get any good comparison theory to prove that the theory works very well. This problem doesn't have a good comparison. And no, nobody knows how to do it in several dimensions. In one dimension, there is a trick by Regine Monod and collaborators to use viscosity solutions for an integrated model. In several dimensions, this is a beautiful open problem. If you want to solve it, we will be immensely happy. There is another model that we uh, produced with better properties because we were very upset about this bad semi-group. You construct the semi-group for the people in mathematical physics, and it is not a good semi-group, and they are really a bit upset. You have to do something for them, like uh, a toy that is better. We constructed another model, and there is a second model that has beautiful properties. Now, the discussion that we had with Luis Caffrelli, we started to work on this, is you will have finite propagation or not? Let me understand the point. I, com I have a combination of porous medium, porous medium equation, that has three boundaries. The Barenblatt has a sharp interface here, and the solution is from here to here. But then, on the other hand, I have fractional diffusion that has a tendency to have tails that go beyond Bangalore. So the problem that the people in physics wanted to know, if you put the two things together, will it have compact support? And then we wanted to prove that it doesn't have compact support and didn't work it. So we said, let's prove that it has compact support. And this is what we proved. Uh, before we proved that, 
We prove something that people in mathematics want to know, especially if they are from Paris. They like these things that decay with time and depend on the powers. This is a typical ultra-contractivity th statements of nonlinear semigroups. So we prove this thing. But essentially what I wanted to tell you is that uh, uh, solutions have compact support. So let me see. Uh, I don't want to jump on that. Okay, maybe I erased one of the transparencies that I had written. And I, I will tell you, how do you prove that things have compact support if they are not comparable? This was a question that haunted us, and uh, it was solved by a beautiful th idea of Lewis. So you have a certain solution that starts like this. This is to zero. And you want to prove that for t larger than zero, the solution is supported maybe here. And then uh, how do you do it? Well, you wrote the equation as u equals gradient u gradient p plus u Laplace and p where p is k of u, which is nice to do computations. Remember that every time you compute p, you have to compute an integral, right? And we wanted to do something about something is missing. But if you analyze well the equation, there is hope. And the hope says it comes from viscosity theory. People like uh, Guy Barle in France. They say, listen, if you look at the viscosity equation, you can compare in some cases. There is always hope. This lady will always tell you yes, maybe in 20 years from now. So let's see if there is a way of writing this way so that maybe there is a super solution that does larger than Laplace and U, Laplace and P plus U. Let's linearize falsely around this thing and try to see if there is a certain capital U that is so big that you still can compare. And the idea is that we did that. We constructed a traveling wave that moves in this direction, u equals certain function of x minus ct, with c very much larger than 1. We put it into this comparison, and we say, is it possible that u equals u at t larger than 0 if u is larger than u at t equals 0? And then the problem is, can you compute these terms so that you prove that my constructed traveling wave is a super solution for the linearized version with coefficients that are chosen in a very uh, ad hoc way by estimating on my function. I estimate the integrals. So I don't compute with the real equation. I compute with the certain coefficients that are estimates that I can do on the integrals where the solution is true. And I know something. Up to the moment t1, this thing is less than this. And there is a moment where it touches. So the only thing I can do is estimate the piece using the information that u is less than capital U. Can you do it? And we did it. So the th the, there is no comparison, but there is comparison with certain things that I call exaggerated super solution which is a Spanish super solution. It is very simple. Okay, now let me tell you something more. How much time I have? You have 10 minutes. Okay, let me tell you what is the uh, t type of analysis that you do with energies when you want to prove estimates for regularizing effects. The Moser technique, you know, it in implies multiplying by a certain cutoff function, integrating by parts, and the cutoff function is chosen so that you are integrating level sets that have a certain uh, scale of, uh, of sizes. Uh, so there is a level M, and you start with M, M in half, minus one fourth, minus, and then you have to estimate integrals. So if you want to apply the, 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 the uh, 
the, the Georgian method, what you want to do is to try to do these famous integrals that are important in the estimate of energies on level sets. I avoid then the, 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 the difficulties of these level sets, and then I only prove what is at stake in the estimates with fractional ablations. Suppose that you have your equation, and you multiply the equation by f of u, ut equals f of u, gradient of u, gradient of k of u. This thing gives a certain f of u dx between t1 and t2. So this is very standard. If you multiply a certain function, you get the integral of the nonlinearity because you integrate in time first. So a capital F is the integral of a small f. That is very easy. How do you check the rest of this thing you integrate by parts, and then the problem starts. You integrate by parts, and you get gradient of f of u, u gradient p, and p is an integral of u. And then you have, or use the u, put it into the f. u gradient f of u is gradient of another function, h of u. And then what do you do with gradient h of u, gradient minus Laplacian minus one of u? If this is the expression that you have to understand what it means. And then what you do is call it by linear form. Once you call it by linear form, and then you say, no, it's a bilinear form of h of u that you call it v and u. And you try to understand in harmonic analysis what you can do with the integrals. It's plane of integrals. There are two gradients and a certain kernel. You put the kernel, you put the two gradients, and after certain computation, you discover that you can write it in this way, in this way upstairs. The gradients can be passed from here to here. And this is really what you want to do. This is the kernel, and these are differences, these are differences. The differences are put there, because otherwise, if you don't use this normalization, it's singular. But you already know that you can do this trick. Oh, but this is the, it is the Gallardo norm of the fractional spaces. So we are working in fractional uh, Sobolev spaces. The, the Sobolev is Lobodetsky spaces. So essentially, my bilinear form is equivalent to the bilinear form of the Sobolev space interpolated between. And then this is, uh, you go back to Jacques-Louis Lyons and the rest is uh, working. So let me tell, tell you that there is another version of this equation that produces a very nice semigroup that is simpler in some sense. Instead of doing this complicated thing about de deriving the equation from the porous medium splitting, just replace Laplacian for minus Laplacian to the S. And now the, the question is, is this justified by some application? In fact, the people in statistical physics knew about that, and there are models developed by Stefan Ohl, Milton Hara and company. And at Andasophilos and Caparelli did a continuity of the temperature at the boundary heat control problem based on one of the problems posed by Jack Louis Lyons. And this is, the, this is the problem. Now, the only thing I want to say about this problem is that it has a nice theory, it's a very nice semigroup, it's a contraction, and you can do many of the things we did before with an extra thing that it is contractive. So all the estimates will work very well. But essentially the, the fractional spaces are the same. So we have the two models, and uh, this model interpolates between the porous medium and interpolates between this absorption problem. And we prove that this is an interpolation from these two problems. And then we did the constructions, and uh, there are a number of people involved in developing the theory that goes with uh, these two models. So I have been using the work of my collaborators in Madrid, one of them is Matteo Bonforte, who is in Italian, who is now professor in Madrid. And we did, uh, uh, once you know that you can do the Georgie, you want to do Harnack inequalities uh, 
the, the general theory of parabolic equations based on estimates. And we did this. And then uh, we wanted to do more general models. You put a fee and not a power. Are you dependent on having powers? It is not clear. But it took a long time to do the calculations. And we did it with my collaborators, uh, Quiroz, uh, Pablo, and Rodriguez. And then we did symmetrization with these guys in Italy, Bruno Bolzoni, and we did propagation, KPP propagation. And the uh, problem is, uh, we started with the motivation from numerics, can do the numerics. So many people are doing now the numerics, and I quote the people who are trying to do efficient numerics of fractional applications. It's not easy because it goes to infinity. And uh, uh, the model that we used with Caffarelli had m minus 1 equals 1, and p equals 1. And in that case, we, we proved to find the propagation. So the question was posed to us, is it a special case of finite propagation? If you move the exponents, will you lose finite propagation? And this was the work of two guys in Madrid uh, and uh, a, a, a people in Poland. The people in Poland are Biller and collaborators, and the people in Madrid are Stan and Teso. And then uh, the last thing we did uh, was doing operators in equations in bounded domains. And this is a big thing. And now the point is why this is a big thing. Because you have to know what happens when you are in Europe and you have information theory with possibilities of talking to people outside. How do you do the boundary conditions if your call goes to Bangalore? There is a possibility. Every time that people go outside, kill it. And this is the Dirichlet boundary conditions. You kill the call. Another possibility is knowing beforehand what happens outside. And this is the non-zero boundary conditions. G of x when x is not in omega. But you have to know all things outside. Otherwise, you cannot solve your problem. Can you put conditions only on the boundary? You cannot. Unless you do this trick that was done by Luis Caffarelli. And uh, was extended by people, which is extending to one dimension more. Suppose that you have my domain now sitting in arena, which is omega. And I extend the u of x into a certain potential capital V of X that satisfies a certain field equation that is the famous Caffarelli field equation. And then you take the trace, and this will be the Laplacian. So the trace of dV over dx will be the minus Laplacian S of U. How do you put into practice the idea that you get a bounded domain? You put into practice this idea by selecting what is your potential. And there are two ways. Option one. V sits in whole upper space. And uses V on the boundary equals zero if X is not in omega. Extend it upstairs by using zero and omega. This is what you call the natural definition. But people in spectral theory have option two. Do a cylinder and put V in the cylinder, which looks more geometrical. Now, what do people in geometry do? They do both things. And well, the project about bounded domains is a project with Matteo Bonforte and uh, Yannick Sir, and we are working on that, and we have published two papers, and we are trying to understand how many options you get. In fact, there is a third option that appears in the, in the, the statistical theory. When you jump over the border, if you are next to the border, you can think about uh, how to continue. The solutions that wanted to go back are allowed to leave. The solution who wanted to go out, 
They are killed. How do you translate it into this extension? We still don't know, but there is a third option. And uh, after that, I will just tell you that uh, there are a number of problems that have to be solved. For instance, one of the problems is extending this theory to pill ablations, which is a very natural object. This is something that people are doing. And many people are doing uh, ablations with general coefficients. This is a very active theory now, what you call rough kernels. Instead of Gaussian kernels, risk kernels, rough kernels. So there are lots of things that we can do. And uh, it's open, for instance, you can do chemotaxi systems with fractional diffusions. Point in this thing is selecting the problems that have beautiful mathematics inside. So the number of problems is infinite, the number of good problems is limited. I selected more or less the ones that we think are interesting. These are the young collaborators, the last things. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was very young. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You were as young as that when I met you, in the, we discussed that? 2011, right? Or 10? Okay, okay, uh, so this is it, thank you.